stand inside the mute space of synaptic me and you. I see our landscapes unknown face when lightning flashes through. In spite of dangers from the storm, I foolishly remain to dance in yielding blindness and to follow love again. To follow love again. Under the planet's captain, dance in Early 1961. I'm so glad you're here. I missed you. I was getting worried that you were going to stay over there forever with your jolie tranche and all. The three girls had created that expression in college to describe a particularly good and delicious looking man. Luke was French too, so I expect he fit the bill nicely, Perry continued. We really should have chosen a French restaurant in his honor, but I love the pizza here. It was February, and they had gathered together at Lombardi's, celebrating Stephanie's return. Peary looked at Stephanie expectantly, waiting for details. Oh, he was as pretty a slice, if I can translate literally, as a Frenchman could get. But he was a sweetheart as well, and very good to me. We were companions for each other, lovers too, because we all have those times when we need someone. Indeed, said Peary, although sometimes that doesn't pay off too well. Remember that guy Andy that you worked with? Stephanie nodded as she sipped a bit of her drink. And the night at the pub when he was so pissed off with you and Leo? Stephanie put the glass down. Don't say it, she said. Wish I didn't have to, but unfortunately I was experiencing one of those times of need, and Tom and I had agreed to allow each other that sort of thing, so I just went for it. It was a one-shot deal, and not a satisfying tryst. And worse, Andy seemed to be trying to talk me into staying with him, doing some kind of sales pitch, like a vacuum cleaner rep. That turned me off. Thank God for Tom. She grinned and continued, But your jolly tranche now. Was he tranchant in his love making? She laughed at her own pun and gulped back more wine. That is such a bad one, I'll ignore it. He was refined, unlike some people, and much more than a pretty boy, quite brilliant, in fact, and a friend. But I couldn't stay. I had to get back and use all that architectural visual input I had had. And besides, we had agreed, back when you and Tom got married, that we would have an official review of our lives at least once every five years, outside of our regular contact. And here it is, five years already. Hard to believe, isn't it? Harder for me than you two, I'd say. What with my two boys being born practically immediately one after the other, how far I am from that, quote, special day in a woman's life, quote, that brought me to the unending and insane chaos of balancing my life in theater and domesticity. Domesticity is its own brand of theater, believe me, and it's bloody hard to remember to thine own self be true. Shakespeare didn't have to wash diapers or attend parent-teacher meetings. Okay, if we're battling for the All My Trials Award, I think I should be in the running. Domesticity and diapers apart. At least you have a helpmate in Tom, and one who makes you laugh at that. While I, poor unattached soul, have to struggle with convoluted mathematical formulae, obscure and constantly changing scientific papers, astronomy, and all manner of very, very difficult and complicated stuff, all the while trying to bring up my poor, 
one parent to child who never even gets to see her mother. Goldie drank her wine in a very slow and deliberate challenge. Yeah, your poor child who is taken care of by your mother, coddled and treated like a gorgeous baby queen, and fed in that unique Jewish tradition of eat till you drop. Oh, that's when her father, who pays you support and does not bother you with his life or laundry, when he is not taking Miss Princess to the Museum of Modern Art or the zoo, or the Hamptons, no less. Peary placed her glass on the table with a definitive clunk to end the argument. The friends laughed together and acknowledged in a toast to themselves that they were all very lucky and happy women. They then toasted Stephanie's return, as well as a new name. It's so you, said Goldie, lighter and fun and perfectly modern, and it represents the start of a new passage in your life. To the future. And they toasted themselves again, and detailed moments as they had done in college. They reviewed Peary's search for her mother in Hungary, and the luck she had had in finding a neighbor in the remote Hungarian village where she had been born, which led to her finding her sister, born to her mother after she had been abducted. Her father had never known about this girl, who was 24 years old when Peary found her. Although their mother had died, Peary had been ecstatic to find Esther, with whom she was now in constant contact. They heard about Goldie's excitement in her studies and her progress in the space program, her flying trips, her work in textiles, a new venture that had taken her to Bruno in Czechoslovakia, via connections her grandparents had made in work they did before traveling to the New World. Stephanie told them about the wonders she had seen in Europe, all the architecture, her changing personality, her plans to someday return, and finally about seeing Tep in Paris, shocking her friends into silence. That's a large part of why I had to come back here, she said. It was like we'd never been apart. He said he had sent a letter. She paused. He must have sent it after I moved in with you and Tom. And then a look of horror came over her and a frown, and she was silent. Peary and Goldie waited. He asked for my address in Paris. I gave it to him but left Paris so suddenly without leaving a forwarding address. I just decided one night in January, got a ticket home, quit at the computer place the next day, and said goodbye to Luc and Madeleine. I was gone within five days and didn't even think about having given the Paris address to him. My God, girl, phone him, said Goldie. Tell him. I can't. It's the same old story. He's married, remember? I have to wait for him to call me, or for him to return for a gig in New York. In the springtime, when all is light and sweet, I think of you and how you came to me. When roses were blue. Unexpected, but I knew I'd found my heart a gentle storm that swept along a music man who moved with song. Springtime brings you back to me, sweet promises of love. How I wish that you were here. Your melody so warm and clear I would tell you April 1961 The gig never happened. Stephanie watched the papers regularly and saw the parade of other jazz men come and go, but no tap. Through the rest of February and all through March and into April, she was haunted by thoughts of him and by a nagging feeling that she should call him anyway, despite his family situation. She started letters to him. She even picked up the phone, but she never acted. 
Perhaps he had simply been being friendly, and the request for her address had been like the we must get together sometime comment that so many people make without any real intent of following through. She felt such an urge to tell him everything, how much she had always loved him, how his spirit poured into her heart, changed her life, how important he was to her. She ignored all the inclinations and tried to focus on her work. The phone rang one overcast April day, and Stephanie heard the giggly voice of Goldie's two-year-old, coached by her mother in the background. Hi, Auntie Tap. Do you want to go out today? Stephanie was ironing a daffodil yellow shirt for work on Monday, pressing the pleated front and smoothing out the sleeves in an attempt to smooth her anxiety away. She relaxed into a smile at the sound of the child's sing-song question. Hi, my love, Dub Deb, she replied. It's so nice to get a call from you. Are you at home alone today? She knew Deborah loved to play at being grown up. They had a whole repertoire of pretend ladies and parties they attended together. Oh, silly, Mama's here. Can you come over? We have, um, um, chalk chip cookies and halba. What, Mama? No, halva with an H. Stephanie had heard Goldie urging her daughter to add the extra enticement, along with the spelling lesson. You know, I was just wishing that my friend Mrs. Cook would phone me today. I've been missing our little talks, and I wanted to show her my new dress for the ball. So you bet I'm going to get on the subway right now and come to see you. Make sure you put the kettle on. Okay, I'll look out the window. And the line clicked off. She was just pulling the apartment door shut when the phone rang again. Running to get it, she remembered that earlier in the week she had promised her younger sister that they would go shopping at an art supply store. They were going to get Easter decorations and paints for eggs. In her absorption with her thoughts of Tep, she had forgotten and she assumed the call would be from Yolan. When she picked up the receiver, she heard her friend Peary greet her in an unusually subdued tone. Hi, Peary. What's up? I was just going over to Goldie's. Are you okay? You sound a little unlike your usual happy self. Peary sighed and blurted into the phone. Turn on the radio, the local station. There's something you want to hear. And call me back, hon. The radio was playing one of Tep's tunes, and Stephanie was enjoying it, remembering, as always, Tep's smile as he looked over at her while he played it on the piano. She smiled, too, thinking she didn't mind this interruption to her plans. When the song was over, she heard the unmistakable tones used for serious topics. He said, Tep Peterson... The legendary pianist had died. She never called Peary back, and she never made it over to Goldie's. She found out later that Peary had contacted their friend and explained. She never really knew what she had done on that day, because the news had numbed her, and she had lost the rest of the day to the thick fog that her mind seemed to coil around her body. She wept, of course. She knew that. She couldn't stop. And she remembered that she had paced the apartment, unable to sit or eat or think. She walked from one room to the other, banging the wall as she went. She put a coat on to go outside, then took it off and just sat in a chair. She jumped up and broke all the stems of the flowers that had been in a vase crunching the blooms at the same time. She threw the little porcelain dog she had bought for him in the Paris airport, listening to it smash into pieces. She looked into a mirror and cursed herself. It was days before she could talk to Bill, Tep's friend, but even as she talked, she knew she wasn't really there, and that there was nothing Bill or anyone else could say to ease her loss. He did tell her he was going to San Francisco for the funeral. As Tep's out-of-town girlfriend, 
If that was what she was, she knew she couldn't go. So she paced and wept and listened to a record of his. Goldie sent her a newspaper clipping about his death, and she read it and wept more. There were two worlds, the one in which they had been together and the one with him gone. And now the part of herself which had lived with his spirit being a part of her seemed to be gone too. In spite of their separation over the last year, there had always been the connection that her heart had known. And even though she felt too shy and unimportant to speak about the depths of her feelings, she had always felt secure in their connection, as long as he was alive. Death, in its abruptness and finality, left her mute. In later years she would reread her journal entries for that time. Two days after his death, then two weeks, and again and again. She was struck by a profound sorrow. She felt unknown to herself, torn, unable to rejoice in the enrichment that she had once known, to grow the seed that had been planted. She was silent, except for her tears and her writing. In later years, she would see the words that never failed to bring back the pain. When someone affects you so much that you know it absolutely in your heart, when you hear your inner voice speaking, but you ignore it, you kill yourself, you demean yourself, and you die. I can never redeem myself to a natural state of wholeness. I can be happy eventually and find a bit of what I lost, but not with the same childlike truth. I denied myself and my true heart with that painful thought, she made the decision to make her life a search for the joy and meaning that she once shared with Tep, whether in another relationship or by herself, through her work or friends. Getting worn, but still I hear a song. Trumpeting majestic sights, mellowing the lonely nights, calling me to distant heights and leading me along. Great emotions never spent, countless hopes and wishes rent. All the good intentions meant to write a worthy poem. Well, if I die before. January 1962. Stefan Sabo was finally getting some of the recognition that Stephanie had always wanted for him. She looked at the piece he was finishing and exclaimed as he ran a soft cloth over the wood and inlay. It's so beautiful, Dad. It amazes me still, after all these years, that you can create such intricate and gorgeous colors and designs in the wood. How can you make them and then give them away, especially after all the hours of work that goes into each piece? Oh no, my darling, I do not give them away. I sell them. And this work will be seen by many people in his new home. The man who purchased it has a very prestigious position with a government office and entertains at his home always. So it will be enjoyed and admired by a lot of people who perhaps, who knows, will want to buy their own special table or carving. And finally your dad will have the American dream he chased for so long. I only wish your mother was here to share in this good fortune. Stephanie saw a flicker of sadness in his eyes for a moment before he picked up the table and put it against the wall. You deserve your good fortune so much, Dad. You and Mom worked long and hard for many years. I wish she was here too. That wood is polished so finely 
It's dark and shiny like her hair, almost black. She would have loved the curves and the inlay and the way you outlined that one section with the tiniest pieces of gold. It looks like a fine thread. They looked at each other and gave a little sigh. I know, she said. You always have to find the gold thread in everything, even the bad times. I remember that and all the other advice you gave me. Thank you so much for that and for these last few months. I don't think I would have been able to get through them without your help and just just your being here with me, for me. Stefan hugged his daughter as they started towards the stairs to the kitchen. You are my gold thread, he said. The thread that began in our old world and brought us here to new opportunities. I wanted you to have a good life, Ilona. Oops, I mean Stefani. <laughs> He put the emphasis on the second syllable. Sorry, I forget sometimes. It's okay, Dad. Sometimes I do, too. Her father looked at her in surprise. Oh, you know, when I get angry or impatient with myself, it's always Ilona I regress to. I'm sort of like you or Mom now, a parent to myself who doesn't get things right or understand, a child. And I have to teach myself to be better. That's Stephanie's job. Yes, I am a little crazy too, she added as her father looked at her again. Then he shrugged and led her up to their lunch. Stephanie had been devastated by the news of Tep's death. Shocked, then thrown into a state that she could not understand or control in any way. Shrouded and silenced by a profound and painful emptiness, she felt as though she too had died that part of her had withered, the part that his spirit had nourished. She fell into her old self, the one who had never known him, the helpless and obedient child of earlier years. She went back home, where her father willingly welcomed her. Although she continued at the job she had found on her return from Paris, it was without the joy she had experienced when she first began her career. She did good work, as always, but she lost her ability to dream and look forward. Her father saw her in pain and was kind and gentle, which only made her feel more sad on top of the gratitude. Kind and gentle reminded her too much of Tep and the times they had shared. Somehow, the drifting apart that had happened had always seemed okay in a sense. Although she always loved him and missed him, she knew on some level that she had to go on with her own life, that his was too separate from hers, his career, his age, his wife. At least that was what she told herself, and she carried on with her life's plan. Knowing that Tep was alive and imagining that he still cared for her gave her the strength to carry on apart from him. Death, however, put an end to all the possibilities and hopes that had lain dormant. Death didn't give any second times around, any chance meeting in Paris, or reunions in New York, or anywhere. She tortured herself with these thoughts, and with the realization that she would never be able to say all the things her heart had felt. So many times when they had been together, she had been too shy, or felt too unimportant to speak her heart. Her humility now seemed like foolish pride. She was just standing in one spot with love in her hands unable to touch. It took a lot of conversations with her father, a lot of time and determination to live her decision to be true to her heart, which to her was Tep. Stefan listened and talked to her of his life and dreams. He reminded her of some of the dreams and ideas she had had as a little girl. She was surprised at the many ways in which they were alike some of his secret wishes, and some of the jazz tunes he knew, the fact that she hadn't even known he knew any. He encouraged her to write, which she had tentatively begun, and praised all her little houses, as he called each story or poem. This one needs a little gargoyle or two, he would say when he felt like a part needed some expansion. 
As a child, she had looked at her parents' collection of photographs of buildings in Hungary that had many and varied gargoyles, some of them very frightening. She'd seen them in Paris, too, on the Church of Montmartre and the Cathedral of saint eustache and she remembered the one on the Chrysler Building in New York. She liked the way they looked out and down at all the life of the cities with their strange faces and expressions, watching and maybe laughing at the people. She felt a bit like a gargoyle when she wrote, studying and distancing herself as an observer. Looking out on the world, she gradually was stirred again to discover more for herself and her own story. She had read about an international competition back in 1958 to find a design for a new city hall in Toronto, up in Canada. There was a winner, an architect from Finland, she thought, and the building of the new structure had begun. She had also recently found a book in a second-hand store, published in 1934 for Toronto's Centennial, and had been intrigued by the city. She remembered that Tep had spoken of playing there in the 40s at a club called the Top Hat, in December, she had applied for an opening with an architectural firm and had just got the good news that she was a good candidate for the job. They wanted her for a final interview. I have some news to tell you, she said as her father cleared the soup bowls and went to the counter for the sandwiches. The afternoon sunlight was making silhouettes of the china birds that her mother had collected. They looked so real, sitting on the rocks, on the windowsill, and she remembered her and her sister naming them all one year, long ago. Peppy, that was her favorite, the little orange-breasted one with the black head. Her father placed the plate in front of her, and she told him that in February she would leave for the northern city. Stefan looked at her without speaking for a long minute, then leaned over and kissed her forehead. Serensis, Godspeed, he said. Allerge as Egypt. Reach the sky. Stephanie chewed the ham and cheese sandwich slowly and smiled. Delicious, she said. You are a master of all arts. Today I say my life is going to be sweeter than before. All the days to come will be the ones that shine I feel it in my bones, yeah, goodbye to the blues On my way, I haven't got the time Can't you see, I hear a melody All the songs to come will be the ones that swing I feel it in my bones, goodbye to the blues On my way, I'm on my way, I haven't got the time Can't you hear me when I say, don't you know that I'm Listening to a brand new tune, it's hotter than the month of June <laughs> Stephanie wandered around the corner of Spadina and College, looking for a building that a co-worker's aunt had worked in before she got married. There's a little alleyway just west of the corner on the south side, Laura had told her, and it's in there, behind the stores on the street. It says City Dairy on the front, and there's a big milk bottle that says it as well. It's a neat old place that most people don't know about. I wouldn't either, but for Aunt Lucy telling me about it. Stephanie found the hidden edifice and wondered how much time it had left. Toronto seemed to pull down a lot of its historic structures. Fortunately, they hadn't torn down the beautiful old city hall when they built the new one. She was spending her Saturday in this, her favorite pastime, as she did wherever she went. She had walked down Spadina from the area on Bloor Street where she roomed, and where she had met Robin, a new neighbor. Later on, she would meet up with him at the Colonial on Young Street, a place he told her she had to see. Then they were going to the town tavern to see Anita O'Day with a jazz combo. There were a number of places in the city that featured jazz that she had discovered, where she would bring a friend along and enjoy the music she had learned to love. She took out her little brownie camera and snapped the old dairy before continuing her tour. Robin was a refreshing soul who had brightened her life considerably when he moved into her area. 
The other neighbors were good people and friendly enough, but Stephanie had not made any real attachments to anyone, except for a few children on her block. When she met Robin one day, he was standing over some flowers he had put into the front garden, speaking to them in alternating coaxing and exasperating tones. Please grow. I'm so sorry I forgot to water you. I'll never do it again. Stephanie laughed as she walked by and called out in a little voice, You said that last time, and I was so thirsty. I couldn't even stand up straight. Robin turned around, and she saw his open, engaging face and a big smile as he walked towards her. Hi, I'm new in town. Well, this part of it. I was actually born in Toronto, but... Oh, I'm talking too much. Sorry. Bad habit I have since I moved here, since I don't know anyone yet. Talking too much and talking to myself out loud. Robin Kingston, pleased to meet you. Whoops, my hands are a bit mucky, he said, wiping them on his pants. I've seen you on the street, going by in the morning, all smartish and businesslike. Yes, well, one has to be smartish, n'est-ce pas, when one is working in the world of art and business. I'm Stephanie Sabo. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks for planting flowers. I've done nothing at my place, but it's just a rental, so I probably never will. Robin invited her to sit on the lawn chairs and join him in some iced mint tea, moving quickly into the house to get the cups and chilled teapot. Stephanie sat down and admired the fading lilacs and the dizzying smell of the linden trees on the lawn. Thanks for this. It's very civilized. But then this neighborhood is. It's so attractive and gracious looking. I love all the houses and how each one is so different from the others. They're quite huge and splendid in the stonework and design. Hmm, yes, that's why I wanted to live here. I had been living in Scarborough with my parents, if you can imagine that. But I had friends. Well, I had a boyfriend, if you must know, and I think, I'm guessing, that that's something I can tell you. I thought when I saw you that you were an intelligent and open-minded person. Anyway, my boyfriend told me about this area. He also got me a job in the art gallery, which was, is, amazing. I love it there, and here. So was I right? Are you intelligent and open-minded? Apt to accept? He took a sip of tea and passed some cookies to Stephanie. I think you'll find I am adequately apt. And if you and your boyfriend are happy, then bravo, and I wish you many years together. Love is love, and it's always a good thing. A good thing. She mimicked a song from Nashville she had heard. Which gallery are you working at? I've seen the Isaacs on Young, but I'd love to see some more. These are good cookies. It's what I do, when I'm not at the gallery or devouring art books. Mmm, I love chocolate chip cookies. Can't help devouring them either. My gallery is a small one on Hazelton. I'll take you there sometime. That area is quite a lot of fun. Nice old row houses with a lot of character. And they're cheap rentals, too. It's good for young people with guitars and not much else. I hope they preserve it. It sounds a little similar to the brownstones in New York. Not really the same, but for sure they are worth preserving if the developers don't get there first with their big bucks. This city is starting to change a lot, which is good, but I sort of like those old town vibes, too. When she got to the Colonial, Stephanie was pleased to see that there was some music on in the afternoon. She searched out Robin and joined him. Stan Getz, he said, holding up a promotional card. Coming here soon.
1966. I was an idiot, that's all. In spite of her commitment to live with love in her heart since Tep's death, and in spite of her success, Stephanie had moments when she seemed to fall into a black hole of sadness. She and Robin were sitting in the huge living room of Stephanie's apartment, a spacious paneled area with high ceilings and lots of light. Stephanie had filled their glasses with a fine red wine and put out cheese and nuts to nibble. Over the previous two years, they had become good friends, sharing ups and downs as well as outings to theater, music, or art shows. I was, Robin. I mean, I don't want to hate myself over it, but I just wish I'd been more awake. I don't know if it was just me or the times, but I should have known better and more. I feel like I was in a dream. In fact, the dreams I have about Tep are more real to me than a lot of my life. In dreams, we're in different clubs that he's played in New York. We see each other and reunite and are so unbelievably happy together. I tell him how much I love him. He invites me to travel with him. I had one dream when we were together at a musician's party in California where I've never been, although he told me once when we were actually together that I should go there that my spirit was more akin to the West Coast. He took me away from the crowd and we went off together to the beach and made love. But then I have this other dream, I've had it more than once, where I'm in a room, it's always the same room. Tep is there and he's talking to me, but I'm just lying there asleep, hearing him, unable to move. He's sad and I want to comfort him and be with him but I can't wake up. It's maddening, a horrible feeling, and I don't know where we are or were, although I seem to know the room in my dreams. I think I was like that when I met Tep. I loved him so much, but it was as if a part of me was asleep and didn't recognize what we were to each other. I could never say out loud how I felt, and I let the love of my life go. You were young. He was so much older than you, and married, too. You probably thought he was just having some nice playtime with you. Uh, uh, I mean, Robin tried to backtrack. I mean, I'm sure he did love you. It's okay, Robbie. I think on some level I thought that, too, back then. But that's the stupid part. When I think back now to how he was with me, to things he said, to his reactions... It seems to me that I missed what he was really saying. And I've read books written about him, which make me doubt my assessment even more. I knew he cared about me, but I didn't know that he loved me and might have wanted me to go with him. God knows, I wanted to be with him. I just never imagined he wanted it too. Now I think he did. But you couldn't go. You had family responsibilities and your career, which in a way was a family responsibility too. Yeah, taking care of my brother, plus living my father's dreams for me. My dreams too, of course. I wanted to study. I wanted to get out there and live my life, have all the experiences I'd been so sheltered from. I wanted to become someone. Tep already was someone, and like you said, he was married. I was too young. It never occurred to me that he was looking for something else, and I thought I should find someone my own age. What an idiot! Stop saying that. I can't. It's the inevitable conclusion I reach. Well, you didn't know everything back then, but okay. If you were an idiot, then so was he, for not making sure you knew, not telling you how he felt. He let you go. We were both treading softly, perhaps, instead of demanding things. He saw where I was heading in my life and probably didn't want to hold me back in any way. Maybe he thought he should let me go. He saw how young I was emotionally, in spite of my years. I never had a lot of contact with my peers outside of school and work. I followed all the rules, 
but had never learned to listen to my heart. He had a lot more life experience. I didn't know you have to grab life sometimes. But he saw you that time in Paris, and he still didn't tell you. He had been very sick, and I didn't tell him anything either. I think we were both avoiding any embarrassment about unrequited feelings. More foolish us. It was only after he returned to California, when he knew he was dying, that our hearts were able to connect with each other, to communicate beyond our bodies, I mean. I felt his calling to me so strongly. I wanted to write to him or call him. I wanted to tell him, I loved you so much, you were so important to me. But my doubting mind and ego prevented me, as they always had. You almost made the trip there. I remember your phone call to me about it. <laughs> almost, yes. But he died before I went. Oh, Stephanie let her head drop, and the tears fall. She could not remember that day without pain, the black emptiness she felt when she realized he was truly gone, the falling through an alien space, the naked nausea. When all the wishes and dreams and plans were over, she felt that only hollow ego was left, that she was a pretend person, a shriveled, shadow. I couldn't function. I wanted only to be prostrate, inert. Even though I knew I had loved him, my reaction to the loss of him literally floored me. I didn't know myself or what I had felt until then. Robin took his friend in his arms and held her, and prayed that he would never be so bereft. He had boyfriends, that, and he had loved and lost, but he had never been so demolished by emotion. Tell me more about him, he said, stroking her arm and head. What was it about him that made him so important to you? I mean, besides his talent and his good looks. He twirled a bit of her hair in his finger. I can't deny the talent and good looks, but it was something else. It was my heart. I've said that before. I think I said it because I didn't see my own heart. I couldn't recognize that his spirit and heart were like my own, or at least how I wanted to be, because my heart was just a kernel then, something I had to grow. But he made me feel my heart, and he made it glad. And that's a lot, you know. Nothing means very much if in your heart you don't feel love. I don't mean love from someone else, but love that is awakened in you as a part of being alive. Tep woke it in me. In Europe I lived and grew a bit, but when he died, I determined consciously to make it part of every day, a gentle, exciting awareness. The kimono, dancing in the wind. I want love, of course, but even without a relationship, that spirit is my goal. Sometimes I feel it, but today I'm missing the music. Good love will make you dance, my mother told me. Tep did that for me, and I want to keep the dance in my soul. Tep was also intelligent, honest, and passionate, oh yes, very passionate, and compassionate too. He was kind to others, and generous. Stephanie stopped, took a deep breath. Well, I have to admit, that's a lot of... Robin blew out some air. Everything. My God. It's everything that everyone wants in another person. Wow. Makes me feel totally inadequate and, and hopeless, actually. None of my boyfriends would ever describe me like that. You're here. You're listening to me, and you're my friend. You're part of the heart now. I would describe you that way. Stephanie paused. Except for the good looks, of course. Too bad about that. She laughed and fed him a bit of cheese, and then continued. It's true. Tep was an exceptional person, 
but I think that perhaps there was another side of him that kept our relationship at sea, so to speak. And maybe that's why I could never talk about all I felt. There was one time when he said something, almost muttered it to himself, about not liking the life he led. And I got mad, unusual for me. I confronted him. Why don't you change it? He didn't answer, just went into the other room. We didn't really ever fight because our time together was so precious, but it wasn't all perfect. Was his marriage a kind of security for him? Was he not the flawless person that I saw? Was he afraid, like me, of following his heart? Even though his subconscious actually changed his perception of me that very first time we met, he thought I was his first love, Ari. He didn't quite have the courage to go with that kind of love again, as much as he wanted it. Yes, maybe he was a little afraid. When he was away from his day-to-day -day life and playing music, that's when he became larger than life, became all the things that he loved, and that let him fly. Stephanie took another sip of her wine and bit into a Brazil nut. After a while, Robin said, Hey, want to go to the coffee mill? You know that place in the Lothian Muse on Bloor? It's a nice, hidden and dark space, and they have yummy danishes. We can walk a bit on Yorkville Avenue and maybe even hear some music in the riverboat, if you want. Stephanie lifted her head and smiled a big sigh. Sure. Sounds good. We could stop by my friend Dennis's, too, maybe. He's an architect in a little cubbyhole office nearby, and he loves music, too. Well, he loves jazz, not folk. But sometimes the riverboat has bluesy folk music. I've seen Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee there, and according to Tab, blues is where jazz got started. Yeah, I read a quote once by Art Blakey who said Charlie Parker had told him he was wondering when young people would, quote, come back to play in the blues. I got a feeling about love I think it's gonna come my way Got a feeling about love It's gonna be a happy day I got a feeling about love The thought is running through my brain Love, 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 love I think I'm gonna fall again signs are right I know when the time is here I can close my eyes and feel the light of a romance drawing near Gotta feel it about June 1976 The day had been very warm Summer was finally arriving in Toronto and Stephanie was once again with her best friend Robin they had treated themselves to an early evening movie at the Uptown and were on their way to Bourbon Street, the jazz club. Robin had converted easily to music aficionado and was enthusing about a new album he'd found. It's a fabulous pairing. Two guys who swing so totally and together they are just incredible. You'll love the first song. I found a new baby. It's infectious. I'll play it for you when we get back. Then they get into some beautiful ballads. Zoot Sims and Joe Venuti, just the greatest. And you'll love Zoot tonight. He is always cool. Stephanie was remembering a story that Tep had heard once and then repeated to her. It was about Joe Venuti, famous for his practical jokes, and for the time in New York when he was traveling the subway with a trumpet player who had only one arm. They got on the crowded subway car just inside the door, and the door wouldn't shut. The train couldn't go until the conductor came down to investigate. Turns out Joe had put the prosthetic arm in the door on purpose, and Wingy, not feeling it, had no idea. Joe thought it was hilarious. Robin laughed. I think Venuti played in Toronto, too, maybe at the town tavern. Do you remember the first time we went there, he asked, those long years ago when we first met? I loved the piano player they had there and the house band. They were phenomenal. Yes, I remember. His name was Norm, and he was amazing on his solos. So musical and inventive. 
But then, backing a singer, he was quiet and tasteful. I really appreciated him. Tep taught me to listen. He told me about other pianists, too, all his favorites and the famous ones, of course, but also some who were not so well-known, but cool. Can't remember them all. Only one name that stuck because I liked it. Ruby Bloom. Tep taught me a lot. And you've taught me. They opened the door of the club. We've gone to a lot of spots and drank a lot of booze, which I intend to do tonight, too, so be prepared to be a leaning hole on the way home. I need to drown my latest affair in some good whiskey. Inside the room, the music was swinging, as promised, or being delicately delivered in a quiet ballad. Suit Sims had a trio of top Toronto musicians with him, and they were giving the crowd their money's worth. Robin and Stephanie were losing themselves completely, victims of the wine, the pasta, and the sweet melodies. When they weren't totally occupied by all that, they got to discussing a recent show they had seen at an art gallery that had featured a lot of bicycle paintings, big, colorful canvases with typed messages that had charmed them both. I like bikes. I guess Curnot did too, since he painted so many. There was a nice old Schwinn parked outside the club tonight as we came in, said Stephanie. I should get one myself for getting around the city. The band was taking their break, and the waiter came around to their table asking if they wanted more wine. I thought it was whiskey tonight, my friend. Isn't that what you said? Robin downed his glass and he nodded to the waiter, addressing Stephanie. Any port in a storm, and this is a nice dark wine, almost port. Sometimes you have to adjust for the main course. I really like this band, and the saxophone is fabulous. Tep spoke to me about Zoot. He had known him, but this is my first time seeing him. She looked over to where Mr. Sims was sitting at a table near the stage, across from a young blonde woman who seemed to be with him. The two of them reminded her of Tep and herself many years prior, him performing, her obviously taken with him. For a moment, it made her a little sad. Then she shook that off, getting up to approach the musician, dragging Robin with her for support. Excuse me. Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Sims, but I just wanted to tell you how much I am enjoying your music. The gentleman looked up at her and smiled. Thanks, he said gruffly. Glad you like it. Stephanie hesitated for just a few seconds, then added, um, you used to know a musician that was a great friend of mine, Tep Peterson, a piano player. He spoke of you to me many times. He loved your playing. Tep, yeah, he was great, man. He was very cool on the piano. I always thought the piano was the best instrument for understanding music. You see all the notes of the chords. Tep knew his music, and he was a good guy, too. Wish he was still around. I used to see him out on the West Coast when I was out there. Yeah, he was a cool player. He told me about California a lot. Said I should go there, but I've never been. Well, you should go, said Zoot. You'd like it there. Lots of crazy people there, you know. He laughed. Maybe I will, said Stephanie. But I won't keep you any more right now. It's your break. It was nice to meet you. Zoot nodded to her and smiled again, then turned his attention to his young date. Be gentle, sweet baby, seeking the light. This night down in the cold shadows flit by down in the cold say your goodbye the shadows nineteen thirty four Daddy Daddy Ilona was running down the street of her primary school, 
running without luck after the car she had spotted passing in front of the schoolyard as she left to go home for lunch. Why was her father driving around here, and why didn't he stop at the school? She knew the car, a used blue one with a curved top. Her father had bought it only a few months earlier, the whole family, which now included her year-old baby brother, celebrating with the special dessert that was their favorite. Dobostorte. Stefan Sabo had been saving for three years, since their arrival in New York, and had been so proud to finally have enough money to provide better transportation for all of them. Ilona ran after the car, still calling for him, until she saw that he was not going to stop, that he was too far ahead of her, turning the corner. She stopped, and then suddenly realized with embarrassment that it hadn't been her father at all just another man in a car that looked like theirs. She looked around as she stood on the sidewalk, ashamed of herself, and thinking that everyone must know how stupid she had been. But no one was looking. People just walked to their own destinations, not even noticing the little girl. She continued on her way, too, without looking at the shops she normally did, the fish and chip place, the bagel store, the corner candy store, hurrying to get home, have the lunch her mom had made, then get back for the afternoon. School was all day now that she was in grade one. She should have known better. She hid her embarrassment from her perfect father and mother, never telling either one of them about her childish mistake. The incident taught her to be sure before she chased people for goals. She was an independent person, determined to make her own way in life, and she learned quickly.